Hey, welcome back fellow dividend and value investors. What's been going on with Visa? The share price has dropped 20% since its recent highs this summer, and I saw many dividend investors entering positions into the company, especially more recently. But why did the price drop so much? I think most of you have already heard of the Amazon news more recently. But was it just that? Let's have a look into that today, because in today's video I'll try to briefly clarify why the stock continues to decline, and based on that we'll do a quick stock analysis of the company. As you hear, we have a lot to get through, so stay tuned, have your coffee or tea ready, and let's get started. Ah, and if you're new to this channel, just know that it's my goal to make dividend investing easier for all of us in the community, so a like or a subscribe is always really much appreciated. See you on the inside. So what's going on right now? Let's have a look into that. So what we can see here that in the summer, this was the end of July, Visa was trading at $250 per share. This was quite an increase since the start of the year when it was trading around $210. So it was almost a 15 to 20% up. But since then it has been in continuous decline. And what we can see here, if we look at the, the price action is that at the 26th of October, it released its earnings report. The, the share price declined at the time about 7%. And on the 17th of November, we received some news of the Amazon UK affiliate. And this also led to another seven to 10% decline. So, we need to understand then what happened. So I had a look at the quarterly four earnings. So what's important, Visa has the uh, fiscal year calendar from September till September. So they just rounded up their fiscal year. And honestly, I went through it and I could see nothing here. Nothing that concerns me as a long-term investor. So probably there was something with estimates and such and that analysts had higher expectations. But in my opinion, the earnings were really rock solid. I have no clue why the price should go do down other than some awkward market reaction, which happens from time to time. But as a value investor, from that point of view, these numbers were rock solid, so nothing there. So this 6-7% actually was a gift to people that were already convinced with Visa at $250. So then if we have a look at what happened then with Visa and the news around Amazon, as you can see here, and this is only applying to the Amazon UK, Amazon decided to stop accepting credit card payments via the Visa payment network per 19 January next year. Um, this is quite some big news because, you know, a company like Amazon effectively is saying here that they find the cost too high for the Amazon UK affiliate and the customers there. They say as to protect the high cost and the high fees to their merchants and the customers, they wouldn't like to accept these credit card payments anymore from Visa. This is big news because it can set a precedent for the rest uh, of the world. And this is something, of course, that could be a future impact to the overall earnings power of a company like Visa if Amazon is able to pull this off. Now, what is good to know that Visa replied already uh, on this and they say they are working towards a solution uh, with the UK affiliate. What is important here, I think, also to know is that this cannot be separated from the Brexit news because under the European Union, there was kind of a cap on what credit card payment providers could charge to the merchants and the customers, these fees. Um, the UK is now outside of Brexit, so it allows Visa also to increase prices. So effectively, there's really just going a power play on here in the supply chain, which uh, will have a winner, whether it's Visa or Amazon, or they will both have to contribute a little bit. But it's really interesting, of course, to observe this from the sidelines. But what I think what has been really going on, actually, with all this news, I think the company was priced for perfection because in the summer it had a multiple of 48. And, you know, seeing this, I think just in general that the stock was so much valued that in general we have seen a multiple contraction going back to the mean, which is around 30 to 35 as a multiple based on the historical five year performance. And any news at that moment in time that can have a little blip into the uh, perf perfectness of a company like Visa might react in steep price declines. And that's what I think we are really seeing here. So I honestly believe that the news around Amazon is actually just a gift to long-term investors that are already thinking that Visa currently trades at an attractive price. But if this narrative is correct, then we can also look at the competitors because maybe we can get some confirmation from it here. So what I put here is a chart, chart from Yahoo. You see here Atien, PayPal, 
MasterCard and American Express. And what you can see here is that both PayPal and, and MasterCard are all going down currently and all saw the same multiple uh, contraction since the start of this summer. Only uh, American Express and Atian have been really outperforming here. Uh, I think American Express has been generally underperforming over the last year, so I'm not surprised that they are pretty much holding up. But this just confirms that it's not only Visa, but it's actually the whole industry as a whole. And Visa, I think, because of the Amazon news, has been punished just a little bit harder. Okay, so now that we know this, I think there's really nothing to worry about. Let's have a look quickly into analyzing Visa as a stock. And we start with that by looking into the business. As you know from me, I always look at the following aspects. their catalyst and the mo mode, whether they have it. But then I typically look at the three financial statements. I look at their dividend safety and I do a quick check on their valuation using discounted cash flow methodology. So if we think about Visa, it earns it money really via four business units. And this is a picture I took from the 2020 annual report. So first of all, they have a large part of what they call service revenue. And this is just that that's something they charge you as a customer. Think about your payment on debt on the credit card that you have outstanding. Um, specifically, they earn a lot from the United States, as you can imagine, because it's heavily uh, a consumer of credit cards and, and credit debt. The second one is what they call data processing revenues. And this is really the revenue they get from when you go to the shop and you're using your phone or your card to pay at the shop locally. This is where they collect a fee and this fee goes directly to Visa. Uh, the, another one, the, another one, the third one is called international transaction revenues. Think about all the currency transactions. So if you're abroad and you pay with a credit card, a company like Visa typically takes, for instance, 2% or 3% on the currency at that time of the transaction. And the fourth one is called other revenues and these are like licenses fees to, to to use the visa brand think about the the card that you get from your bank where there's a visa logo in it on it or a mastercard logo this card is not from visa itself it's from the bank but they use the visa payment uh, system to process your payments and they use the branding of visa to make it more attractive to you as a customer so that's how they earn their money there so based on 2020 they had a gross revenues of 20 9 billion almost you need to know that they deduct that also um, with incentive fees that they give to you know um, banks and such to use visa as a payment provider so if we then look at the full year earnings from 2021 you can see that the service revenue is um, around 11 and a half billion data processing revenues almost 13 billion international transaction services six and a half and other revenues 1.7 so what we can say then is that service revenues already brings in a third of their revenues, data processing another uh, third, and the rest is being shared between international transactions and other revenues. So what is really nice, and this for me the main catalyst of a company like Visa, the global payment industry is still expected to grow with 7% on an annualized basis up till 2025, so over the next four years. The main growth is expected to come in APEC, as you can see, and the rest of the world will be relatively stable. APEC here, they mean with the Asia Pacific and Oceania and such. such. So we're really talking here about India, China, and these kind of uh, uh, countries. And this, I think, is really related to the middle class growth that we will see at that part of the planet uh, in the upcoming few years. Um, what I also liked really is this picture, if you think about their business model. And you can see here that Visa as a, is part of the payment networks and probably the biggest here if you look at all of these. But look at this space around digital payments as well in the payment ecosystem. It's really crowded. Um, this also shows you a lot about how competitive this, uh, this area is. This is something for Visa also to look into in the upcoming years. Because you know before they know it, they can really see their business being disrupted. But the good thing is... Visa really understand this, is really on top of their game here. They are investing in this as well. And I would suggest you, if you have any doubts here, just read a little bit up on that. You can go to their investor relations website and you will see what their plans are actually for the upcoming years. I like what I'm seeing here. So therefore, I think really that they are in a good position also for the upcoming five to 10 years. So let's have a look at their financial performance then. I think this is really important. A good business doesn't necessarily make it a good stock. So if we look here, what we can see from the last 10 years, their revenue increased from 10.5 billion to 24 billion. This is a lot of growth, more than doubled. That's what we like to see. So this is like kind of an annual growth rate of 10 to 15%. 
At the same time, what I love are the margins. Look at that, around 80%. This is typically a margin what you see at a monopoly. Um, I think what it tells us that Visa as a company being a uh, payment processor and their network is such a strong lock-in to the whole payment ecosystem that's really hard to replicate. It also comes with really large barriers to entry. Of course, there's technology disruption, maybe with blockchain and such, but from what I've read, Visa is on top of it. And even though it will require really, really significant investments from competitors to even try to disrupt the core of what Visa is offering to the world. So we should not underestimate that. And then we can see this back in the gross margin. And no surprise, therefore, that Amazon is trying to do something about it. We can also see it back then in the earnings per share, which nicely grew from, let's say, a dollar to five dollars right now. But also the free cash flow. What I really like here is that this is a cash machine, literally a cash machine. In the last year, they earned an operating cash flow of 15 billion, which resulted in a free cash flow of 14.5 billion. Because what you can see is that this is a really capex light business model. They only paid 700 million over the last year. So most of the cash that they are getting in can be used directly to reward shareholders, strengthen the balance sheet, or do any other thing what capital allocators typically do. We can also see it back in the balance sheet. They have a balance sheet currently with a total cash position of 18.5 billion, long-term debt 19.9 billion, so almost 20 billion, and total stockholder equity of 38 billion. What this really means is they could probably already pay off their full debt if they wanted to. And the cash flow is covering already 75% of the long-term debt outstanding. So they can pay back all their debt even from cash flow just in one and a half year. This is amazing. Really, really strong balance sheet, I would say. If we then look at last quarter four earnings reports compared to uh, 2019, they say that everything has been increasing since then, which is good because we shouldn't look only at the pandemic. Because if we look at 2020 last year, yeah, no wonder that it's uh, a lot up, specifically international transactions and such that you can see here. Um, no wonder people are traveling, we're traveling again this summer. And this is what you see reflected in the, uh, in the numbers. Overall, really strong numbers. And I think the company did a really good job. I still don't understand why it had to drop of 6-7%. So this is from a financial performance point of view, but how has it been rewarding as a shareholders then? So from that point of view, I think what is really good to know is that Visa had an IPO in 2008. At that moment in time, it paid around five cents on an annualized basis in dividends. So it started paying dividends straight away and it has only been increasing dividends since, uh, since ever then. At the moment, it pays a one dollar dividend in forward dividends this equates to a 0.76 percent dividend yield with a forward payout ratio of 25 percent 13 years of dividend growth and a five-year compounded annual growth rate of around 18 percent this is really large and you don't see this a lot elsewhere among dividend paying companies if we then look at the buybacks this is really what i love here because they have been buying back shares continuously. Look at that, 3% buyback rate per year, so buyback yield in 2013. At the moment, you see it decreased a little bit. This has not, not so much to do with the buybacks itself, but more with the share price. So you just get less shares for, for, for the cash flow if you wanna buy it back on the open market. But look at this, also the financial discipline, 14 and a half billion free cash flow. What did they do with it? They bought almost back 9 billion in shares. They paid almost 3 billion in dividends, also paid down debt by 3 billion. And they effectively used their whole cash flow for this. I think this has really been rewarding shareholders, even though you could consider that the prices were on a high level. So, but there is one catch though, because it's a low yield company. I typically look at dividend paying companies to have a 2.75% yield on cost before I start investing. And I think this is the reason why if we take this into consideration and let's assume that they will continue to grow the dividends with 15% per year annualized over the next 10 years, we will be only talking about 3% yield on cost in 2031. This is not a lot for me. And this is really something that I'm, I don't like to see at a company. Um, it's just a really low yield paying company, but okay. Maybe I should consider this because it's a high growth company, low yield, and I don't have them a lot in my portfolio. I could say only Apple or Microsoft, but you know, Microsoft I bought at the time at a 3% yield on cost five years ago. So price appreciation was really the reason there why the yield is so low. 
So having said that, the shareholder returns have just been amazing. But also let's look a little bit into the risk because every company comes with some risk and understanding the risk the business faces is really important for us as long-term investors. So actually, the first risk for me is not something that Amazon is doing, but it's a regulatory risk. I think you will see more and more regulations coming in. The European Union already did something around this, around the fees that such companies are able to charge to the customers. I think this will continue. This is for me one of the biggest risks to the business model because this is the highest likelihood to put their operating margin under pressure. Technology disruption is the second one. I do see uh, disruptions like blockchain and such coming up, companies on top of it, but hey, maybe it will lose their swag and other companies will be better positioned. We see this from time to time in industries. Nokia, as an example, was not the company that was able to lead us into the future of how we interact with each other and communicate with each other. Apple did this. So this can happen here as well. Third one, of course, if, other, if Amazon is successful, maybe others will follow. And the last one, if the trust of Visa as a network would be disrupted by, for instance, a security breach or a major hack where people lose money, then that might be also, of course, a really big risk. I find these risks on the lower end of the spectrum, although I see severe competition at this company, I think their network, their payment processing network is so strong that it will be really, really hard to, to disrupt it. So risks are limited in my opinion, but they do exist. So take that please into account when you're considering Visa. So knowing all this, I think we are now at the right time to start looking into the value of the company. Since its inception in 2008, it has been paying increasing dividends. But look at these other numbers, the five year dividend growth rate, the chowder rule, but also the EPS and the free cash flow payout ratios. They are really low, which means that I cannot foresee them still in the next 10 years not pay, being able to increase their dividends. So I think that's pretty safe from that point of view. What we can see on the valuation, however, it's quite lofty. It's not 48 anymore, the current PE, but it has come down to around the 40 number now. Forward PE, if we take the forward earnings into consideration, I think it's going towards the 30, which for a high growth company is not too bad, I would say. What I really like a lot here is that the return on invested capital is much more than the weighted average cost of capital. This is what we call value creation and it has been doing that at a rate of 15%. This is really good. So let's also have a quick peek at what the uh, uh, analysts are, are thinking about the company. So they have a consensus EPS forecast of $7 for the next year and all the way to almost $12 in 2025. This is really a large number, a high number, because they are coming now at a $5.5 for 2021. What is good to know that over the last four years, the analysts have been reducing their earnings numbers down. I think this has to, a lot to do with the Amazon news and probably something related to the earnings numbers where they expected even more. Take these analyst numbers always with a grain of salt. For me, it's just a quick check to see if there's anything wrong in my own assumptions. So if we then look at the discounted cash flow valuation that I use, I assume earnings per share next year for $6.5. Uh, it isn't being used in the calculation as such, but I thought it's good to share that here. So having said that, I use a 13.5 billion free cash flow as a basis for this calculation, not 14.5 billion, because I do believe that this year's cash flow numbers were a little bit stronger because of certain working capital adjustments. So I'm a little bit more conservative on that. But on the growth rate, I'm not taking, let's say, the 17% that we have seen with the dividend growth over the last five years. I'm a little bit lower on my baseline. And here I use a 13% growth rate for the upcoming five years going forward. After that, I model in with a 6% growth rate and I would like to see a return on investment for myself of 10% uh, generally for the companies that I'm investing in. I believe that such a quality company deserves to trade at a multiple of 20 and I give the probability of 70%. The optimistic case is a little bit higher. I use this dividend growth rate of 70% going forward in the next five years and then 8% going forward. And the bearish case would be really bearish, just 5% around the current rate of inflation and a 2% growth rate going forward at a multiple of 15. So this is not a lot, but you know, really want to model also in the bearish case here. 
So if we look at all of these numbers, what does it give us? It gives us a fair value per share of $182. Compared to the $198 right now, I believe the company is still overvalued. Um, if I would like to buy it, uh, generally, if I would like to go big into it, I would like to see a margin of safety of 10% and I would be a strong buyer at $165 per share. Based on the current share price, this means that the shares still need to come down around 15%. However, I might initiate a small position around $185 itself. As Buffett always says, um, better pay up for a high quality company at a fair price than a mediocre company at a cheap price. Um, this would be then an initiating position just so that I start tracking the company. But with the current price of today, $198, I'm not buying it. I still find it too expensive. But hey, if you're interested in all of this, I will put the link to this discounted cash flow sheet into the description of this video so that you can play a bit with it yourself. Just go to file, copy this file, and then you'll be able to have a local copy on your Google Drive and play with it. Having said that, uh, let's do a quick recap. Catalyst and Moat. I think the Catalyst is strong. The Moat is strong. I still put uh, such a smiley for potential future disruption here in the technology space. And this is more related to the margins. I don't know if they can continue to keep 80% margin into the next 10 years going forward. But all the others look really good from my point of view. And the valuation could come down a little bit. Although it's not too bad from that point of view after the recent price action. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did so, don't forget to like this video. If you have any questions, reach out to me. You can do that via social media or just via the comment section below this video. Thank you for staying so far with me and have a great remainder of the day.